Hey YouTube, Joshi here with Tipsy Python, your casual guide to learning how to program with Python, and today I'm back with another video. I got a couple goals for today's video. First off, we're going to talk through iterables, and secondly, we're going to go back and enhance that sales tax calculator that we started in the first couple of videos. And today I'm sipping on Old Forester 1920 Prohibition style bourbon, and at 115 proof, this one's pretty stout, so let's hope that I'm coherent by the end of the video. <laughs> Alright, enough playing around. Get your swingers ready, get your drinks ready, get your computers ready, and I'm getting straight into it. I'm opening up Jupiter. I'm going to start by working through an object called prices. I'm going to make a list with some integers inside of it. Now this should look very familiar because last time we talked through lists, but lists and many other collections have a special property that makes them iterable. And I know that you're thinking, yeah, yeah, Joshi, that's more nerd speak. What does it really mean? Now, iterability in plain English is the ability to iterate through a collection one object at a time. In other words, to perform an action for each item in the collection. You know that I like to just dive into it, so let's just get started and make our first loop. I'm going to begin by writing the keyword for. I'm going to say for price and prices colon then a new line character. You'll notice that Jupyter auto indents four spaces for me. I got four spaces here of indentation and I'm just gonna say pass. Talking through this with the parts that we know, we see that prices is the name of the list that we're gonna be iterating through. We use the keyword for, then we use a temporary variable. Now, this can change, but this is just kind of by convention. You name your list as plural variables, and then as you iterate for each item in the list, you use a singular. So for each item in prices, I'm gonna call it price. For price and prices, perform some action. I'm just using the keyword pass because it's the easiest thing you can do. It does nothing. It says, nothing to see here, just move on. But if I really want to make this loop do something, I could do something as simple as print price. And you'll see that we iterated through this list. We printed every item. And that right there is why I like Python so much. Like, look how easy that is. Look how semantic it is. One more note before we move on. This indent right here is very important. I'm using four spaces for my indent. That's what we typically should be using for our indentation. And in Python, it's important because it signals to the Python interpreter that this is where the logic inside of the loop happens. That in the indented block of code, these are the steps that should be applied to each item in the loop. And this is a pretty straightforward piece of code, but as the code becomes more complicated, we're going to have multiple levels of indentation, indenting, and dedenting, and it's all going to be very significant to the actual meaning of the code. Moving on with this example, a very common pattern that you're going to see is that as we iterate through something, we need to keep track of the index and understand where we are in a list. A lot of people are taught like this. We're going to initialize a counter starting at zero, I'm going to say 4p in prices, print p, and I'm also going to print count. Let's just see what this does. Unsurprisingly, we're printing out each item in the list, and also for every iteration, we're making a second action and printing out count. Now, to make this non-trivial code, I'm going to add one more line in here. I'm going to say count plus equals 1. Increment the value of count by 1 for every loop, and we should have something a little better here. We get the value of the item followed by the value of count and it adds it up for us so that for each iteration of the loop we understand the index of the list that we're on. And people actually do this kind of thing so much that the Python standard library includes a function that we can use to easily do this. I'm going back to the Python documentation and we're going to be using enumerate to perform this count for us. Going back to my example, I'm going to grab this out. I'm going to say 4p in uh, enumerate prices. And enumerate actually returns a tuple. I'm going to unpack it like this. I'm going to say for index p, because that's what comes out of enumerate, print p, and then my index. And you'll see that I have the same functionality as if I initialized a counter and incremented it myself. Now, many times in code, we're going to increment our way through a list or to perform some kind of action. Let's talk about an important rule of thumb here. I'm going to set up an example and say 4x in prices, print prices dot pop. I'm going to remove an item from it. And then after the loop completes, I'm going to print prices one more time. Now, at first glance, you may expect this to work its way through prices, removing one item at a time. But let's check the actual output of it. Now, what happened here? 
things got a little dicey because we were changing the list as we were iterating over it, repositioning the index of the items inside of it. For this reason, it's best practice if you need to change something, you can make a copy of the list or append items to another iterable. Let's just take a look how we would do that. First thing that I'm going to do here is I'm going to use the range function that returns a sequence for us to construct a new iterable. Um, to see how it works, I'm going to say for i in range 10, print i, and it returns a range of numbers like I thought it would. I'm going to initialize a new list that's empty, and as we iterate through the range, new list dot append i, and if this worked correctly, we're going to have a new list that contains our range of numbers. Now suppose that I wanted to work through this new list, removing every item as I go through it. What's another way that we could code this? Let's try one out. For this, I'm going to use a function that we talked about last time to get the length of my list. And then I'm going to combine the output of this function with the range function that we just learned about. Or x in range new, new list dot pop. And this works like we thought it would because the output of the range function is only evaluated once at the beginning of the loop. It's evaluated, we have a range of numbers, we iterate through the range, and then we work on popping items out of our list. Now let's go back and perform one little housekeeping thing here just to keep our code clean. Because we're not using the temporary variable x, I'm going to replace it with an underscore to signal to Python that I don't want to store the output of this range function. As we iterate through the items, I don't care what the item is, I just need to iterate through it, so I'm not going to specify a temporary variable here. By this point, I'm hoping you feel pretty good about for loops, and going off of what we talked about in the last video, I hope you can pick up a collection item and iterate your way through it. But I also want you to know that there are some non-intuitive iterable items in Python as well. For instance, I wonder what happens if we try to use a for loop to iterate through a string. Let's see. Just a dab will do me first. All right, I got a string loaded up. I'm going to set my string equal to sip and subscribe, so for i in my string print i. And what do you know? We actually iterated through every letter of the string, which is pretty nifty for doing things like processing user input. But in a lot of cases, I don't get much meaning out of processing a single letter at a time. I want to do something like look at words. What's a way that we could do that? I got you right here, my friend. So I'm going to use my string. I'm going to say use the split method. And check it out, it returned a list. So we went from having something like a collection of letters that wasn't that helpful to using a simple method, and now we have a grouping of words that we can work with. And just to show how we could do that, I'm gonna say words equals that list for word in words print word. And this is what it's all about, guys. This is how the pros do it. Now, let's try to apply this to our uh, real-world application that we've been making. Suppose that in the Sales Tax Calculator app, we want to allow the user to input multiple prices separated by spaces, and then we'll process those one at a time for them. Let's implement that. Now, of course, I still got calculator.py right here. I'm going to open up with Sublime Text, as I like to do. Now, how would we go about implementing this functionality? We want the user to be able to input multiple prices. Now the first thing that I want to tackle is the input part. We input something with spaces in it. We want to use the split method to split it up into individual parts and then we can process those. So I'll just start on the input. I'm going to comment out our logic from last time because I don't want to think about it just yet. I'm going to say input price dot split by space and we're going to call this list what do you think? Prices. Now if we're going this route, I can't convert to a float right here yet. I'm just going to have to split the input string. And just to make sure that we're on the right track, I'm going to print prices. Let's run here and see what happens. Price item is 10, 20, and 30. And we get our list returned. Now that we have a list of input prices, how are we going to process them? With a for loop, like we've been doing everything else in this tutorial. Let's implement that here for price and prices. The first thing that I want to do, well, I'm making sure that I'm indented here so it's happening inside the loop. Say price equals a float 
of this price and I need tax rate and this is fine we can just keep this as a constant up here then we do our calculation item price equals price times tax rate and finally we got to show it back to the user so print item price let's test this out to make sure we're on the right track again 10 20 30 Perfect. We have the individual item price calculation working. Now I do think there's a few more things that we can dress this up. I'm going to do a little bit of formatting to make it look pretty. And finally, I think a nice touch would be to add a running total of the price after tax. Let's implement that now. So first I'm going to change my prompt. Uh, what are the item prices? Then let's apply the round function here so we get a nice number to show the user. And although I removed the history functionality that we added last time, I am going to keep this list at the top and reuse price list. So as we calculate the item prices, say price list dot append the item price. And let's format this item price a little bit. I'm going to use a formatted string literal here. Um, this price accidentally put the close brace outside of the quote and address up the last statement in here I'm going to use one more formatted string to say the total price is and just when you think I'm done introducing new functions I'm hitting you with one more it's called sum I'm going to take the sum of the price list to get the total I'm actually going to apply the round function here so we get a nice round number on the output and when I execute the program let's see what we get Perfect. Our application is going from something that was relatively trivial to something that's actually adding value. We're saving state as we go and we're getting more complex with the code. Now there's probably still one more question that you have about this code. We're using a while loop and we didn't talk about that in this video, but a while loop is another very common one. It's probably a little less common than four, but it's still used quite often. We'll talk about that next time. Now that's all the technical content for today's video, but I do want to discuss this old Forester 1920 a little bit. I think this bottle will put you back about $60, but really guys, it's a staple to have on the shelf. I mean, 60 is on the higher end for a bourbon, but it's not terrible for a barrel proof at 115. I mean, the higher proof makes this one really robust. Like I can sit here and just nose this bourbon all evening. It's super aromatic. And on the palate, I get notes of leather, oak, and brown sugar. And at the very end, you get like this super nutty, like almost a peanut butter thing going on on the finish. It's really, really good. And one interesting note on the proof of this bourbon, like it says on the front of the label here, that the Brown Foreman Distillery is one of the few in the United States that remained open during Prohibition. Because back then they were able to sell it as medicine, man. Could you imagine that today? I'd be at the liquor store emptying out my flex spending account. And 115 proof is apparently pretty close to the barrel proof of the time. This is a great whiskey that I think tries to be representative of its roots, and it's still a good one to sip on today. All right, guys, I got to wrap it up for today. You made me proud. I really hope you learned something. And if you enjoyed this type of content, please consider subscribing to my channel. I documented my code in a Jupyter notebook. And I'm going to be posting those in my GitHub. I'll have a link in the description below. And our next video will be about uh, the human condition. I mean, conditional statements in Python. Until then, friends, tipsy Python.